Welcome to part two of this video on psychosomatic illness. There are four main aims that I've set for myself for this video. The first is to clarify again the psychosomatic theory. The second is to contrast psychosomatic illness with factitious illness. The third is to look at the two main psychiatric conditions which can cause psychosomatic illness. And the fourth is to go over the, um, some examples of the main conditions that are currently viewed as being psychosomatic. So we'll look again at IBS and we'll extend our uh, remit to look at the more broad topic of functional gastrointestinal disorders. We'll also look briefly at CFSME uh, and we'll look at fibromyalgia. And then we'll end the video. So those are the four aims. So to begin with then, I'd actually like to start with aim number three. Let's have a look at the main psychiatric conditions that can cause psychosomatic illness. So a little bit of a uh, di diversion into the realm of psychiatry then. Um, so psychiatry, a big, big field, getting bigger all the time. However, very simply, it can be divided into five main conditions. And let me write those five main conditions down. And in fact, this is a little bit controversial because I'm in the UK. And in the UK, one of these conditions is put under the realm of psychiatrists, whereas in other countries, it's put under the realm of neurologists. So you'll forgive me for this. But in the UK, the five main conditions that come under the realm of psychiatry are anxiety, depression, psychosis, mania, so those four are uncontroversial, but the final one is dementia. So in the UK, dementia is put under the realm of psychiatrists. To get a proper diagnosis of dementia, you do have to see a psychiatrist in the UK, um, which is why I've put that one on this list. But in many countries, um, it is put under the realm of neurology, not psychiatry. And the reason for that is that with anxiety, depression, psychosis and mania, if you were to scan the head of an individual suffering from these conditions and they didn't have any uh, coexisting neurological condition, you would not at present be able to find anything that is wrong. Our level of medical um, scanning at present, our level of medical testing cannot find a problem, uh, a um, viewable problem um, with the brain in these conditions at present. I am personally very confident that in the future that will change. We will be able to find what is wrong in these conditions, but at present we cannot. Whereas dementia if you scan the head of someone with dementia, you usually can find what is causing it. Uh, often, in the, it is the case in a way that you will see an abnormality um, that you can attribute to causing this. So that separates dementia from the other four. And that's why in many countries, dementia has now been viewed, uh, been moved to being in the realm of neurology because you can see what's wrong with a brain scan rather than psychiatry. But in Britain, these remain the five main conditions that are under psychiatry. Now, this is hugely simplified, of course. Anxiety, if you take just anxiety, for example, in the DSM, anxiety is split up into a huge number of different conditions. You know, OCD, PTSD, generalised anxiety disorder, simple phobias, all of these different diagnoses that uh, are all counted as anxiety disorders, but are all counted as separate disorders. However, for simplicity, we are going to just view it as all one condition, which is anxiety. The same for the others, which can be divided into many different conditions. So psychosis, again, there are a huge number of different disorders that are counted as psychotic disorders. Depression, there are a huge number of different mood disorders. But we're going to have these five main this simple view of psychiatry that there are these five main disorders and of course this doesn't include things like eating disorders and personality disorders very fancy things that um, psychiatrists can diagnose but those are more small print so these are the big five main diagnoses of psychiatry and just in case people aren't familiar with all of these terms anxiety is obviously a disorder of fear depression is a disorder of mood and energy 
Psychosis, what is psychosis? It's much more complicated to say what psychosis is. The main example of a psychotic disorder is schizophrenia. In psychosis, people become extremely disconnected from reality. They start hearing voices that are not there, they start seeing things that are not there, they start having very strange beliefs, delusions, they start acting extremely strangely, um, and the world that they are experiencing is different to the real world. That's what we mean when we say that they become disconnected from reality. What they lose the ability to tell the difference between fantasy and reality. The two of them, you know, we can daydream and then experience reality and we know the difference between daydreaming and reality. In people with psychosis, the two become a blur and their experience of reality is altered by things that are not real, that their brain is creating as though they're daydreaming or dreaming. It's, it's a very, very strange uh, disorder. Uh, people with psychosis and mania, psychosis and mania are the two, if you like, full-on psychiatric conditions. These are the ones that people end up seeing a psychiatrist about. With anxiety and depression, these are far more common than psychosis and mania, and usually they are handled by primary caregivers rather than actually needing to see a psychiatrist. Usually you would only end up seeing a psychiatrist for anxiety or depression if um, you're not responding to treatment or if it's extremely severe and you try to commit suicide. Those are the indications for when people with anxiety and depression would see a psychiatrist, but psychosis and mania, these are, if you like, the full-on psychiatric conditions that do usually end up seeing a psychiatrist, along with dementia, which needs a psychiatrist to diagnose it, at least in the UK. Uh, mania then, finally, mania is the opposite of depression. It is a disorder of mood and energy, like depression, but in depression you go down, in mania you go up, and people with mania become incredibly energetic, they stop needing to sleep, uh, they start getting all sorts of incredible ideas of what they're going to do, they end up spending all their money, they often become extremely sexually promiscuous and disinhibited, um, it's like as though they are on psychostimulants, such as cocaine, speed, methamphetamine, these sort of substances, ecstasy as another example, but they're not on those drugs. It's, um, it's quite amazing to see mania. I've only ever seen um, two people who were truly in manic episodes and it truly stays with you for the rest of your life. It is quite incredible to behold. So mania and psychosis are the full-on psychiatric conditions um, which end up seeing psychiatrists. Anxiety and depression are usually treated by primary caregivers, GPs, but can uh, end up being referred to psychiatrists um, if it's extremely severe. Okay, so uh, that's a little bit of a summary then of psychiatry. Now, we're going to ignore the bottom three. We're going to discount psychosis, mania, and dementia. I just discussed those for a little bit of a sideline. Anxiety and depression are the two main psychiatric conditions. These are extremely common, and these are the ones that are going to be the main culprits for causing psychosomatic illness. So these two, I'm going to draw a little arrow here. And now we'll go back to aim number one, and we will summarise or clarify the psychosomatic theory once again. So psychosomatic illness. So here then is the psychosomatic theory in full. So the idea is that people with psychiatric conditions, and the main two that we are talking about is anxiety and depression rather than the bottom three, the full-on psychiatric conditions. The idea is that anxiety and depression if you have these conditions, these are conditions of the brain, and the idea is that these conditions can result in abnormal signalling of the brain to the rest of the body, and that this can cause problems with the functioning of the rest of the body, such as, for example, IBS, where we had these colonic cramps. The idea is that if you have very bad anxiety, it can manifest, it can cause bad signalling to the colon, trigger these colonic cramps, which then trigger huge amounts of pain, diarrhoea, constipation. That is the concept of psychosomatic illness, that the psychiatric condition is manifesting as a somatic 
problem, hence why it's called psychosomatic illness. Now, the evidence in favour of this theory is that a huge number of people with what we would consider psychosomatic conditions at present do have coexisting psychiatric diagnoses. And even the ones who don't have psychiatric conditions diagnosed, if you ask them about it, often usually you will find that their mental health isn't brilliant. So, um, for example, many people if you with IBS, if you do ask them about their mental health, you will find that they have either anxiety or depression. And often these people do find that um, their IBS symptoms, their gastrointestinal symptoms get worse when the psychiatric condition gets worse, when their mental health gets worse. If you are sceptical of this theory, and that's very good, you should be sceptical, it is a controversial theory, and there are a huge number of sceptics of this theory, and it isn't proven, of course. We don't know the etiology of these conditions. Oops, that's not what I intended to do. Where's my uh, light? We don't know the etiology of anxiety, depression, psychosis, or mania. As I say, if you scan the brain of someone with these conditions, you can't find a macroscopic structural problem. So we're still, biomedical scientists are still working on the pathology of these conditions. So we're nowhere near, if we don't even know the pathology of these conditions, we certainly can't link them to the somatic symptoms at all. We're certainly nowhere near proving this with pathology. So it is unproven and you should be sceptical. But here is something that might swing you a little bit in favour of this theory. We all know that when we're extremely stressed, for instance, before an exam, we get very strange symptoms. We might, for instance, um, need to go to the toilet a huge amount of times. We might get a nervous bladder, as it's called. There is a bit of proof for you that your mental state can manifest as somatic symptoms. Before an exam, your mental state is altered. You're in a very nervous, anxious state. And that mental state has manifested itself as a somatic condition, i.e. a nervous bladder, needing to go to the toilet a lot. So you can therefore maybe start to understand how someone with a psychiatric condition, with one of these two psychiatric conditions, anxiety or depression, where their mental state is permanently abnormal, that they might get continuous somatic problems from having that psychiatric condition. So there, if you are a little bit sceptical about that theory, there is at least some proof for you that um, your mental state can affect the rest of your body. So what were the other aims of this video? So aim number two, I think we have now clarified the psychosomatic theory. We now need to do aim number two and aim number four. So aim number two is really, really important to introduce you to this other term, which is factitious illness. And let me just make sure I spell this correctly, yes. So there is this other concept of factitious illness, and I want to make sure that no one thinks that I am saying that psychosomatic illness is factitious illness. So what does this term mean? Factitious illness is when an individual is making up their symptoms for some reason. And this might be because they would like painkillers. Painkillers is often one of the reasons that patients make up symptoms. So in uh, A&E, uh, or in hospitals, uh, doctors can prescribe very, very strong opiate painkillers. In the UK, we can prescribe IV morphine. We can even sometimes, it's very rarely prescribed, but you can be given IV heroin. So you can be given very, very strong opiate painkillers. Drugs that are very addictive, which are psychoactive and make you feel high. Therefore, some people do come into hospital complaining of pains that are not there and they know they are not there and the reason that they are doing this is to try and get prescribed some strong opiate painkiller. This is what we call factitious illness, when an individual is making up their symptoms. Psychosomatic illness and factitious illness are not the same thing. This is really important because a huge number of people misunderstand this. 
many people think that, many patients think that when we say that their symptoms are psychosomatic, that what we are saying is that they are making them up. We are not saying that they are making them up. Psychosomatic illness, the symptoms are real. The patient does not control the symptoms. Doctors are not trying to say that you are making up your symptoms. It is, what psychosomatic means is that you have a psychiatric condition and that this is subconsciously, not under your control, causing these somatic symptoms. That's what psychosomatic means. It does not mean that you are making up your symptoms. That is what is meant by factitious illness. And factitious illness is rare. Very few patients make up their symptoms. You do see it occasionally, but psychosomatic illness is far more common. So that's aim number two, contrasting psychosomatic to factitious. I also would just like to remind you that we had that term previously, which was functional illness. Functional illness means the same thing as psychosomatic. It means that the symptoms are due to an underlying psychiatric condition that is causing um, these somatic symptoms that are very, very real for the patient, that are not under that patient's control. They are not the fault of the patient. Um, so, as I say, um, this theory is controversial. Many people believe that these somatic symptoms are instead caused by some physical illness of, for instance, the colon in the case of IBS, that biomedical science is not yet advanced enough to actually find. And who knows, it may well turn out that they are right, or it may well turn out that the psychosomatic theory is right. However, at present, the psychosomatic theory is the best theory we have to account for um, these symptoms, and often people find that if you improve the psychiatric condition, if you improve their mental health, that these issues get better. So there is a lot of evidence in favour of the psychosomatic theory and psychological treatment often does work. Um, so that's why we use this theory, that's why we employ this theory. So final aim then, aim number four, which is to um, go over some of the other examples of psychosomatic conditions. So we said we were going to once again go over IBS. We have done a lot on IBS. So I really, the aim is to expand and talk about this wider concept of functional gastrointestinal disorders. So let me write this down. So there is this wider notion of a functional gastrointestinal disorder, which means a gastrointestinal disorder that is of psychosomatic etiology. And IBS is an example of a functional gastrointestinal disorder. So one example, in fact, probably the most famous example is IBS. However, there are others. And these others are often, because they're far less famous, they're often incorrectly diagnosed as IBS. In fact, this is quite an important point. A lot of people aren't brilliant at diagnosing functional gastrointestinal disorders and use the term IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, as the same as functional gastrointestinal disorders. So let me explain that again because I don't think I've made that quite clear. A lot of people use this term incorrectly, slightly incorrectly. They can be forgiven for it, but they do use it nevertheless slightly incorrectly. It's often used synonymously with the term functional gastrointestinal disorder. So often anyone with gastrointestinal symptoms that a clinician believes is due to psychosomatic origin, a functional origin, is given this diagnosis of IBS. And that is slightly incorrect because there are a huge number of other functional gastrointestinal disorders that are different to IBS, um, but which are getting diagnosed as IBS and treated in the same way as IBS. And that's not necessarily good because the treatments for IBS might not necessarily work for some of these other functional gastrointestinal disorders. So let me just introduce some of the other examples, other big examples of functional gastrointestinal disorders and I've clicked on the wrong box. Let me try and get into this box. Here we go. So IBS is a big one, the most famous one by far, but potentially not the most common one, however. Some of these other ones are even more common, but are often diagnosed just as IBS. So functional diarrhea is another one. Functional constipation Here's a one. Functional bloating. And those are probably the four main ones. Whoops, I haven't put a four in there, sorry. 
So there we go, there are four examples of the main functional gastrointestinal disorders, and let me explain what happens in each of them. So, functional diarrhoea, firstly. In patients with functional diarrhoea, they just have loose stools all the time, so they're loose every single day. Um, it can get, it can vary a little bit. Some days they might be a little bit more solid, and some days they might be more close to water, but they don't get the colonic cramps in the way that IBS patients do. The thing that sets IBS apart from these other four is those cramps. So strictly speaking, to be given a diagnosis of IBS, you should have these debilitating colonic cramps. That's the thing that characterizes that disorder, not the diarrhea or the constipation. The diarrhea and constipation are minor bits that follow the cramps. The abdominal cramps is the thing that characterizes this disorder. It's the pain. In functional diarrhea, they might not have any pain at all, but they just have diarrhea all the time. And they come and see their doctor saying, I've got diarrhea all the time. Is this normal? Um, it's, you know, it, it's distressing me a little bit. Um, and often they will end up being maybe diagnosed with IBS slightly incorrectly because, as I say, IBS is often synonymously used with where we should really be saying it's a functional gastrointestinal disorder. So be aware of this diagnosis, functional diarrhea. It means idiopathic diarrhea that we are at present attributing to psychosomatic cause. So again, these people often do have maybe mild depression. Um, and they will find that as their mental state gets worse, those will be the days that they are more loose, that their stools are closer to water. Uh, and when their mental health is better, they might find that their stools are much more solid and um, formed. So functional diarrhea, be aware of that as a functional gastrointestinal disorder. But it might not have any pain, it's just the diarrhoea. If they just have the diarrhoea, this is a potential diagnosis. Functional constipation is the opposite. It is far too well-formed stores. Um, and both of these disorders, by the way, the issue is with motility of the gut. In functional diarrhoea, the gut is moving too fast, effectively. It's moving contents through too fast, which is why it's not absorbing enough water and why they end up with diarrhea. In functional constipation, the issue is the opposite. The gut is moving far too little. And the psychosomatic hypothesis or the functional hypothesis for these conditions is that the reason that the gut is misfunctioning is because they have an underlying psychiatric condition. And in many cases, they do usually, people with these problems do usually have an underlying psychiatric condition and if you actually ask them to keep a symptom diary and also jot in that symptom diary what their mental state is like each day you might get them to spot a correlation that often their mental state is going to be worse on the days that their diarrhea or constipation is worse. Um, now people with functional constipation they might get a little bit of abdominal pain because um, all of the feces that is backlogged inside them that can stretch the colon and give a little bit of pain but it won't be like the sort of horrendous bent over in agony pains that people with IBS get. Again functional diarrhea because the bowel is moving quite quickly that can sometimes cause a little bit of pain. Uh, again widespread mild pain. In IBS the pain will be reasonably localized, it will be localized to the area that is actually cramping and it will be debilitating. And by the way a little bit more of a fact about IBS, usually it's in the um, descending colon sigmoid colon area rather than the transverse or ascending colon. So usually they often get left iliac fossa pain, uh, so down, uh, low down. And that's the most common area for the colonic cramps to occur. So, as I say, these disorders often get a diagnosis of IBS slightly incorrectly, but we can forgive clinicians for doing that because everyone knows that IBS is often used synonymously with functional gastrointestinal disorders. But the problem with doing that is that the treatment for IBS is antispasmodic drugs, drugs to actually stop spasms from happening. And the main example of an antispasmodic drug would be mebeverine. This is the main IBS drug that is used. Another one that can be used is buscapan which is a brand name. I think what's in Buscapan is Hyacine. Uh, whoops, um, let me just... So there we go. So these are the two main drugs, Mebeverine and Hyacine, uh, and I believe Hyacine is um, called Buscapan. Uh, it's a famous brand name for it. 
Um, so these drugs, mebeverine and buscopan, these are... whoops, that's not what I intended to do. Bear with me for a moment. Um, so these drugs, these are anti-muscarinic drugs. They, blot, they block muscarinic acetylcholine receptors and amazingly they by doing that they can relieve these um, spasms of the intestine that we talked about which occur in IBS um, and therefore people with IBS they often take them at the time when they're getting these horrendous spasms to produce relief if they're getting spasms very very regularly they end up taking them every day regularly as a prophylactic to try and prevent the spasms from ever happening however you can see that if you were to prescribe an antispasmodic to functional diarrhea or functional constipation because you've incorrectly diagnosed it as IBS and you know that these are the treatments for IBS it's not going to do any good because these individuals don't have the spasms. They have either an overactive or an underactive, and you certainly shouldn't prescribe it for functional constipation um, because it will make the constipation worse. But these people have a more sort of global motility issue rather than a localized, horrendous, fully, fully contracted spasm, um, and therefore giving antispasmodics isn't going to work. So that's why we should ideally be more careful about giving out this diagnosis of IBS and should instead try and give a more accurate functional diagnosis such as functional diarrhea or functional constipation so that we can better treat these patients. Functional bloating um, is where individuals get um, produce a huge amount of wind um, and this wind when it's in their colon, distends their colon and produces, therefore, a little bit of pain. So people with functional bloating get a bloating pain, a regular bloating pain, they get a lot of wind, and the issue is again believed to be psychosomatic. It's believed to be potentially that the small intestine moves its contents through too quickly, and then a lot of not completely di digested food ends up in the colon, which then the bacteria break down and release all that gas to cause the bloating. So again, functional bloating is believed to be similar to functional diarrhea, but whilst functional diarrhea is too fast movement in the large intestine, functional bloating would be too fast movement in the small intestine that is leading to slightly incomplete digestion. So these are four of the main functional gastrointestinal disorders, they're all believed at present to be psychosomatic conditions related to an underlying psychiatric condition that is causing missignaling to the bowel and is manifesting in these somatic symptoms. Okay, and because it's now half an hour since we've begun the video, I am going to have a break here, and in the final video, which will be a short video, we'll just discuss the final two conditions that I want to go over, which are CFSME and fibromyalgia, and I have uh, a lot less to say about those conditions than the functional gastrointestinal disorders, so it should be reasonably quick. See you in part three.